I'm Jim Brown, your Bible teacher at Grace and Truth Ministries. We have uh, we are on TV all over America in about 275 towns and cities, and uh, most of our congregation is out in cyberspace and on the internet. We are on the internet, needless to say, all over the world. And we get emails from everywhere. Most of our congregations out there in the world, uh, we have very few people here. We had about 40, 45 before the, uh, before the coronavirus hit. And a lot of people are staying away because of the virus. And uh, we're just... Uh, we've got several we've got some people that are just not here right now but uh, <clears throat> we're trying to be as safe as we can and uh, we get people email us from everywhere from from uh, Australia Holland uh, Germany all over South America all over uh, Africa and India and Australia and uh, a little bit everywhere and uh, we have people write to us from the TV stations that see us and uh, we are just trying to get this message throughout the world with the things that I teach you cannot have a mega church it's not possible uh, because I'm teaching that God does not love everybody. Predestination's true. Christmas is pagan along with Easter and all the other holidays. And this is not a matter of opinion. It's a historical fact. These are the people that write to us. Kristen Gable writes to us, uh, and he says, uh, Hello, Mr. Brown. Hey, Christopher. Uh, I've been listening to your teachings on YouTube and I'm very intrigued by them. Currently, I have been listening to your Revelation series and I have a question if you would be kind enough to give me some insight. I understand that the ten horns in Revelation is referring to the ten tribes of northern Israel and that's exactly true. Likewise, are the ten horns in Daniel also referring to Israel? Let me explain this to you. I've explained it many times. And the heavens, when you look in, in McClinic and Strong, heavens was a title for the ruling class. And God told Israel, he said, if you're obedient to my word and you do the things that I say in my statutes, my commandments, then you'll go against your enemy one way and they'll flee seven ways. It doesn't matter how many there are. We see that illustrated over and over again when Asa went against a million Ethiopians and the Ethiopians had the iron chariots. An iron chariot had the wheels, had these scythes sticking out like those kind of scythes you cut down wheat with. Nobody could stand against those scythes, no one. And they had 300 iron chariots a million men, and Asa had 500,000 men. And they went out against him since Asa was a righteous king in southern Judah. They whipped them hip and thigh, beat them really bad. And we saw Israel with 7,000 fighting men go against Ben-Hadad and the troops of Assyria, of Syria and there were 120,000 of the Syrians, and there were, uh, there were 7,000 Israelites, and they beat them really bad. The whole point is, as long as they were obedient to God, they, could, they were the heavens. They were the heavens. When the ten northern tribes of northern Israel, they were called ten horns, 
when they went after Baal in the grove, they quit serving God. And God gave their power over to the beast and said, the beast will come against you one way and you'll flee seven ways. There is no doubt the ten northern tribes gave their power as the heavens up to the Babylon, Persia, Greece, and Rome. No possible way could they have beaten Israel if Israel had been obedient. But that was all in God's plan and program. Likewise, are the ten horns in Daniel also referring to Israel? If so, what is the little horn that displaces three of them? I'm not going to go into that. That is about an hour and a half to two hours just getting started on it. I'll go into that. I've got that on many of my DVDs. Uh, I just can't get into that. That's real in-depth prophecy. I am sure if both references of the ten horns mean the same thing since Daniel, they are said to rise out of the fourth kingdom. The fourth kingdom is Rome. It's Roman Catholicism. Could you please give me some insight into this? If you'll call me, I'll talk to you about it. I would really appreciate it. Thank you so much for your time. Christopher Gable. Some of the things some of you people ask me, it's going to take me two hours to get started. I can't do that. Call me on the phone, and I'll talk to you about it. You can call me at 1-800-625-5409. And then... Stephen Mosif in California writes, uh, Dear Pastor Jim, Sister Mary, Brother Tom, Brother Mike, and all Grace and Truth Ministries, love unfeigned. I like that. He always says that unfeigned is anupokrites, A-N-U-P-O. K-R-I-T-E-S. It comes from H-U-P-O-K-R-I-T-E-S, which is the word Hippocrates or hypocrite. And the alpha privet in front of it translates anupokrites. It means without hypocrisy. That's what it means. Love and find it. Stephen Mosif in North Hollywood, California, checking in with you all. It's been a minute since I last wrote. I'm enjoying and learning from your teachings on YouTube and appreciate so much the DVDs. Keep them coming. The world is is a most oppressive and stupid that's right place to be stupid is the word ba'ar in the Greek in the Hebrew ba'ar and the word alagos in the Greek ba'ar is the word brutish it means to have the understanding of a stupid brute beast that cannot learn and brutish in the New Testament means logos with the alpha in front of it means no word of God in their heart. They don't have it. They're stupid. And a lot of these preachers are just stupid. They cannot learn. And then he goes on to say, uh, <clears throat> well, I don't know where I was. I wrote, he says, I'm checking in with you all. It's been a minute since I wrote. I'm enjoying and learning from your teachings on YouTube and appreciate so much the DVDs. Keep them coming. The world is a most oppressive and stupid place to be. I work with a lot of professing Jews, most of which are born in Israel. A few are American-born and a few are European. Most are wealthy and live to practice their religious holidays. There is a point none of them believe in God. I share with them scripture and most will say that the God of the Bible is communist. Well, that's true. 
That's what's so funny. People get it. The word fellowship in the Greek is the word koinonia. K-O-I-N-O-N-I-A. It's the word fellowship or partaker. And in the second chapter of Acts, everyone came together, put all their money into one place since the church was just beginning. And they all shared, and they shared it equally in what they needed. They gave to every man as he had need. When you translate this word kononia, which is the word fellowship out of the out of the Bible into Latin. Here's how it translates. C-O-M-M-U-N-I-S. That's the word fellowship. If we really lived the way we should, we'd share it with everybody. But you can't put Gorbachev or Putin or one of those murderers in Russia ahead of a fellowship system. Here's what really gets me. They built an atheistic nation on a Christian concept, and we built America on an evil concept because capitalism has the exact same meaning as D-A-I-M-O-N-I-O-N. That is our word demon, and it means to distribute fortunes. Distribute fortunes. And when you look up capitalism in a Webster's Dictionary, like this one right here, you look up capitalism and it will tell you that it means to distribute the fortunes of the individual, the fortunes of the world to the individuals like railroads and factories and so forth. It has the exact same meaning, capitalism and demon. What do you think we need, Jim? Well, we don't need communists because it doesn't work. They always put some pagan ahead of it, and we don't need capitalism because they put a pagan ahead of that. What we need is the theocracy. comes from theos, which is the word God, Theos, God, and Kratia, God ruling. That's what we need, not a theocracy. They got a theocracy among the Muslims, where Islam rules. We need the only God ruling with his book. I'm gonna I'm not gonna break any laws in America, but I don't believe in America. It's going down, and it's going to hit the bottom before long. I don't even know how. If you define words, you find out. It's, even in the garden, they had a democracy. A democracy comes from demo and kratia. It means the people ruling. Well, who ruled in the garden? They had a government of Adam by Eve and for the devil. Democracy is of the people, by the people, and for the people. Nothing we've got in the world. Men cannot invent a, a way of government that works. Men can't do that. I don't believe we're any different than Russia. What do you mean by that? Well, these guys in, in Washington, they're ruling with an iron fist, aren't they? Sure they are. And I'm not... I don't care what they do. I'm waiting for Jesus to come get me out of this insane world. That's what I'm waiting for. That'll be enough said on that. The world is most oppressive. He says, this is from Steve. I share with them scripture, and we'll, he's talking about the Jews he works with, and make, we'll, and the most will say that God is a in the Bible is a communist. They don't even know what they're saying and neither does Steve. And there is another life form out in the universe means they believe in aliens and UFOs. Well, the Bible says 
Eve was the mother of all living, and that's what Eve means, the mother of all living. So if there is anything out there in our humans, Jesus only died for his wife, the church, which is humans. Not all humans, just his predestinated elect. Quite astonishing for such highly intelligent people. I don't think America's very smart. It baffles them when I spring forth with Ezekiel 14.21. For thus saith the Lord God, how much more when I send four sword judgments upon Jerusalem, the sword, the famine, the noisome beast, and the pestilence. The word noisome is the word raw. It means evil. Well, bears aren't evil and tigers aren't evil, but Babylon, Persia, Greece, and Rome are evil. To cut off from it man and beast, all of them worship tradition, not God. Pastor Jim, you have a course. You have, of course, through your decades of dedicated studying of the Hebrew and the Greek, text of God's word instructed an ignorant man like me to somewhat so far be able to present the truth as the Holy Spirit guides. Thank you brother. Postscript as as the Lord continues to bless his flock through you. I am sending a PayPal offering to be split equally to ministry and benevolent fund. Farewell and be of good cheer. As always, your brother in Christ, Stephen, in California. We love you, Steve. Keep on writing. And uh, Nate Martin in Hutto, Texas. Uh, Pastor Jim, I love the instruction of your teachings. Thank God for exact definition of truths. When you don't like what I'm teaching, you hate definition. It doesn't matter whether you believe that fellowship translates into the Latin communist. It does. That's your problem. Thank God for exact definition of truths. I love the part about knowledge. A pastor twisted the gifts, maybe not intentionally, but he said, knowledge shall increase, so... How can it vanish away? He's talking about having men write down the knowledge of God through inspiration of Scripture. He's not talking about knowledge will pass away. He's talking about men who write it down will no longer do it. When the Scripture comes in its fullness, there will be no more prophets. I felt he knew nothing about the original word meanings in Greek. He was basically saying that we need all the gifts to keep the church edified. Sounds like a Pentecostal or charismatic to me. But I was getting angry listening to him because he was so boastful as if he knew what he was talking about. Most of those guys are. You can't listen to them. Like my cousin says, we can't get mad at them for their ignorance. That's right. God made them that way. Uh, which is so true to an extent. If they're intentionally twisting the word, I see why they need rebuking and reproving. And I'm more so getting mad about their understanding that is leading more people from the truth. I know God will not lose any of his sheep. It just hurts me to see some of them lying to a little unlearned sheep. Me too. It makes me angry. My grandpa is 88 years old and he believes what he was taught about speaking in tongues and nothing else. Define the word tongue. Two words. Glossa and dialectos. Glossa means foreign language. Dialectos means a dialect. They had a different dialect of the common street language in every city state. That's why they said, How here we were, man, in our own dialect wherein we were born. This is Jews from every nation under heaven in Acts 2. That's all he knows, talking about his grandfather. It seems 
like you can't even teach him with proper teachings because he doesn't know what most of the words mean even outside the Bible. He loves God so dearly, but his past teaching has him locked. What can we do to help this situation? If God don't want to help him, you can't. He never went to the ninth grade, but back to the pastor, he said, when Jesus comes back, that's the perfect coming. No, it's not. When the perfect is come, teleos, T-E-L-E-I-O-S, that's the word in the original Greek text. It means the complete or mature church. Peter said it was here in his day. Not only not only will tongues pass away, knowledge will pass away, but the gifts of an apostle passed away. If the gifts are still here, then if you're a committed Christian, you should be able to raise the dead. You want to try it? You should be able to be bitten by a king cobra and not affect you or a black mamba. Those are extremely dangerous, the black mamba. Uh, it's just crazy. They like the uh, new tongues, but they don't want to drink some strychnine, and they don't want to be bitten by a black mamba because they can't survive that. When Jesus comes back, that's the perfect coming. No, your grandfather's ignorant. And all shall be done away with. I asked the pastor, why does he say tongues shall cease? He couldn't give me an answer. And I said, of course, tongues will cease when he comes back because there will be no reason. There's no reason to have them today. You've got, you've got the Bible written in every language in the world, including Swahili in Africa. And the language is glossy to be around, but that's not what Paul meant. That's right. I can sit here and take you about an hour to go through that, but I'm not going to do that. Thank God I do not just listen to you and don't search even though you have gained my trust in facts with God's word. But I go back and search up the words. Good for you. I buy books you mention, and hey, I, all I can say is you have not led, led me wrong. Only because the Spirit, I believe, has guided you into truth. Thank you, Pastor Brown. Much agape and flail. Nate Martin in Hutto, Texas. And then Kevin in Hutto, Texas. Y'all need to get together. Hello, I saw the part where Jim read my message. I'm almost famous. I had no idea Nissan and Abib were the same. Well, they are. They called March, April, Abib in Israel. When they went to Babylon, they called it Nisan. Pastor referenced the Hebrews utilizing two calendars. The first had seven months. The seven-month calendar was not a full calendar. It was their, their uh, crops calendar. It went from the first month, which was Abib or Nisan, all the way to the seventh month, and that was their festival calendar. The first month is March, April. That's when the first crops start coming in. The seventh month is September, October, and that is where the, the final harvest was coming in. That wasn't the full calendar. The calendar went from Nissan to Nissan. This was just their harvest calendar. And then the first has seven months based on agriculture. That's right. I'm going to assume the second calendar has 12 months. That's right, from Nissan to Nissan. Seven to 12 months, and it's based on the lunar cycle. Correct? That's right. As far as ember days, I think it is part of the Catholic doctrine or perhaps some Orthodox Christian denomination. I see it referenced in Farmer's Almanac, the 10th, the 8th, and 10th this month. See attachment. 
I look forward to your input. Also, I received Nate's email. I will message him back shortly. He lives in the same town, Hutto. There's about, I think there's about 3,000 people in that city, in that town. And for your information, Hutto has tens of, oh, I thought it had just a few thousand, tens of thousands of people. This year's graduating class alone had a couple hundred people. We have over a dozen prayer houses hosting different denominations. And we have hippos everywhere. <laughs> Blessings, Kevin in Hutto, Texas. We love you, Kevin. Keep writing and get together with Nate. And then uh, Sherry Redberry. Hello, I'm confused. You said thousand years, but my KJV says one thousand. Forget your. You cannot trust the KJV in everything. It says a thousand. It says Satan was bound a thousand. A is an indefinite article. There were no in definite articles in the Greek. You got to deal with that. How do you can you tell if it's an indefinite or a definite article? There's twenty four definite there's twenty four ways to spell V and they only had the definite article in the Greek. Thousand thousand they didn't have zeros in Israel. They the only it is not thousand, it's Kilia C H I L I A. And any multiple of a ten, a hundred, or a thousand was a form of the original number. Ten or hundred or a thousand. One thousand is not an adjective. Adjectives tell which, what kind of, how many. 1,000 is not an adjective. 999 is an adjective. Tells how many. 1,000 is a noun, just like dozen. Just like dozen. Dozen takes 12 to make a dozen. But it's one dozen is singular. That's like one pound is 16 ounces, but it's still singular. So you have to understand, kilia is plural. So it means 2,000 or more. And it doesn't have 8,000. There's a lot of mistakes in the King James Bible. It's not the King James Bible I rely on. This is what I rely on right here. This is where the King James Bible came from. It's called an interlinear Bible. And it's got the Greek on the top line and the English right under it. And I don't trust the English in an interlinear. I go to the Word and see what it is, exactly how it's spelled. The, that's called the Textus Receptus. That's a Latin term meaning the received text. There's a lot of errors in it. I don't believe in a Westcott and Hort at all. That's where the NIV, the RSV, the American Standard all comes from that. I don't believe that at all. And I could go into that and tell you why, and I don't have time here right now. I did a whole series on textual criticism, about 15 messages, and I hit, I hit real hard on it. And then I got some YouTube comments, and these people, don't, most of them don't like me. A cross-country community commented on Doctrine of the Devil, John Wesley, false teacher, uh, women keep silence in the church, holy hands. Ignorance of anti-Nicene history. Predestination, once saved, always saved. I hate that term, once saved, always saved. There's no such thing as once saved, always saved. There is saved only. Saved is the word sozo. And it means 
needs to be taken from one point to another point and it be preserved and protected through the whole deliverance. We have been saved, we are saved, and we shall be saved. It's not a once saved, always saved. That's dumb. Uh, we're exclusively Christian Gnostic teachings. I hate to have to say that you're dumb as a rock. Condemned by the apostles in early church as heresy. No, you're a her you're involved in heresy if you don't believe in predestination. Heresy is the word heresies. H a i r r e s i s. It comes the word hereticos, which is the word heretic. It means to choose for oneself. That's what you're doing. All right, Andrew Stedham, if you do not believe that God hates, you do not believe in the God of the Bible. God hates sin, 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 not the person. David said, I want to hate those that you hate, Lord, with a perfect hatred. In Psalms 139, you're another dumb person, Andrew, and will forgive any that seriously ask for it. Well, I'm not going to go into the word ask. It's a conditional word. Gosh, I'm having some crazy people write me today. Automatic, automatic commented God's own God's sovereign pinwheel. Christ, inner man, is increasing. Hi, Mr. Jim. My real name is Jonathan Moses L. Gura. Thank you for reading my post on your video on your YouTube. I've got to run in on some ignorant person on YouTube. They said that Jesus was a flesh God that we worship, and I got angry because this person was speaking reproach upon our Lord. Don't get angry at him. Why? God made him that way. He wants vessels of wrath fitted to destruction to be out there to give us a hard time. No need to get mad at the world. I think my anger was or gay, Mr. Jim. Or gay means that is the wrath of revenge. You want to get them back. You're not supposed to do that. I've sinned. That's right. I've sinned against the Lord because vengeance belongs to him and I had no business being angry. You're right. Also, please explain. God is not the author of confusion. The word Arthur is not in the text in the 14th chapter of 1 Corinthians. It just says God is not confusion. And that's because there were people coming through Corinth. Corinth is right in the middle of the Mediterranean. The 14th chapter of... of hold on here. 14th chapter of 1 Corinthians is about people at Corinth. Let me see here. Paul said, I don't want anybody standing up and speaking in a glossa of foreign language. The word is glossa. Every time you find the word tongue in the 14th chapter of 1 Corinthians, every time you find it, it is the word glossa, means foreign language. We get our word glossary from that. A glossary is a section of a book with words that are not common to the average reader, and it's usually in the back of a book, and it'll give you what the word actually means. That's a glossary. And they had different glosses all over the world. They had a different dialectos, dialect. They had different dialects of the common street language, the Greek language, all over the civilized world. That's why when all these Jews came from all over the world, when they came to Jerusalem for the three different feasts, Passover, Pentecost, and Feast of Ingathering, well, like here, these arrows are all pointing to Jerusalem. This comes out of a book called the Compendia. 
and it's very it's very very informative book these are eras of Jews coming back to all these three feasts from all over the world they were coming back to Passover Pentecost and Feast of Ben gathering because they'd been scattered all over the world because they went after Baal in the grove and so forth so when, as they're coming back they get here and they had all been in captivity for 600 years or so and they were all speaking different languages and they couldn't even understand each other when they got to Jerusalem but they were required by God to come back for Passover, Pentecost and Feast of End Gathering they all had to come and I can talk about that all day long but I'm not going to alright now uh, so God is not confusion. Paul was pastoring, not Paul. Paul was preaching here at Corinth and said, and this is right in the middle of the Mediterranean. You had sailors from every nation. You had salesmen from every nation. You had dozens and dozens and dozens of glosses being spoken in the streets. And Paul said, I don't want anybody coming in here speaking in a foreign language without an interpreter and do it by twos and threes and stand over to the side and do it. Boy, if the Pentecostals were doing it right, they wouldn't do it, get on TV and go, Shonda Lamanda, Shonda Kondai. It's supposed to be done by twos and threes. And it has to be a language that can be understood. I despise that tongues movement. It does nothing but confuse people. <coughs> All right. Uh, That was Andrew Stidham. Then, oh, this fellow writes on, he likes what we're teaching, evidently. Uh, since God took the role of a potter and we are his workmanship, then I believe that you are one of the great works, Jim. Thank you so much. God molded you brilliantly as expected from the Lord. Everything the Lord, those is always magnificent and perfect. Let's give the Lord praises and glory, brother. Thank you so much. And then, we love you. Keep writing to us. Jeffrey Dean writes to us. And he don't like me at all. Jeff, you're somewhat ignorant, man. So much error in this man's teaching. I'm talking about me. I can't cover it all. Sons of men is not a term for Gentiles. Yes, it is. <laughs> the Gentiles come out of Cain's lineage. Sons of God are those people that are in the lineage of that are in the lineage of God through Adam through so saith dawn down that fifth chapter of Genesis. Ezekiel is called the son of man because he was a human at least 200 if not 300 times in Ezekiel. Messiah called himself son of man because he was a human. Furthermore, son of man merely means a son of a physical person. Furthermore, circumcision of the heart was not just for Gentiles who weren't fleshly circumcised. You had to be circumcised with the heart no matter who you were if you're going to heaven. Circumcision of the heart was required for the Jew who was circumcised in the flesh. That's exactly right. You're right. And if the Jew has not circumcised of the heart, it was said that his circumcision was not uncircumcision of the heart. Well, you're right about that. I never did say a Jew had to, didn't have to be circumcised of the heart. All believers have to be circumcised in the heart. In fact, circumcision is nothing has nothing to do with being a part of Israel. What are you talking about? You're either crazy or you never read your Bible. You couldn't partake in any of those three feasts unless you'd been circumcised. And circumcision was something that God gave to Abraham. And he said, everyone in your household, you are very confused, Jeffrey Dean. Moses commanded 
they treat all Gentiles as one born in Israel. No, they, where did you come up with this stuff? I'm not going to read the rest of this because you don't know what you're talking about. Moses did not require circumcision of the Gentiles. You're right. It wasn't given to the Gentiles till Acts 2. And it was spiritual circumcision that he underwent. There, we were circumcised with a circumcision made without hands. Don't you get that, Jeffrey Dean? Circumcision of Gentiles was purely voluntary. They had to be circumcised if they're going to be a part of Israel and partake of their feast days. You are very confused. Only required if they would take part of the Passover. That's right. But they wouldn't be, they wouldn't be a part of Israel unless they weren't circumcised. The reason the Gentiles did not need fleshly circumcision once they believed is because the law doesn't require it. It requires that we're circumcised of the heart. You go from one contradiction to the other, Jeff. I'm not going to read the rest of this. You are you're really messed up, Jeff. You need to listen to more of my David days. Enough read. Enough said. All right. We are on TV all over the country. We're on in Los Angeles. Uh, we're on in uh, San Francisco. We're on in San Jose. We're on in San Diego. We're on all over the country, and I don't even have all the stations we're on. We're on up in Oregon and Minnesota, and and we're on in, uh, I can't think of everything, Montana. A couple of stations in Montana. We're on in Chicago. We're on in all over New York, Brooklyn, Queens, Staten Island, Manhattan, the Bronx. We're on stations all down the eastern seaboard. We're on in Boston, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. We're on in uh, in uh, Boston, Pittsburgh, Philadelphia. Uh, we're on in Washington D.C. and we're on down in in uh, Charleston, South Carolina, Charlotte, North Carolina, all over the South. I can't remember Savannah, Georgia. Um, a bunch of other places down there. We're on in Mobile, Alabama, uh, Savannah, Georgia. Uh, we're on in New Orleans. We're on in uh, Baton Rouge, Dallas, Fort Worth, Houston, San Antonio, Austin, Tulsa, Oklahoma City. We're on in, in Alaska. We're on in uh, uh, Hawaii, we're on in a station all over Europe, and uh, just if you want our free DVDs, we give them away free of charge. All you have to do is call us at one eight hundred six two five five four zero nine, and they're yours for free, and we won't even solicit you. We give them to you as long as you stay in touch with us. And then we're on TV in Nashville, Tennessee, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday night, and Sunday morning at uh, we're on Channel 49, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at 8.30 at night on Channel 49, and that's Comcast TV. And then we're on Sunday morning at 9 o'clock. We're also on radio down in Nashville. We're on uh, WNQM, which is, uh, that's every Saturday morning at, uh, at 9 o'clock. And that's 1300 on the AM dial. We're on 1360 on the AM dial. And we're on all these stations. Uh, all these times, 1360 on the AM dial in Nashville. And we're on at 6 in the morning, 7, 8, 9.30. This is every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday morning. 
on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday morning. And then we're on 1.30 in the afternoon, same station. 4 o'clock in the afternoon, they were on Saturday, 7 in the morning, 10.30 in the morning, 12.30 in the morning, at right afternoon, and 1.30 on Sunday. We hit a lot of people out there. We give away our DVDs to... We give away DVDs to uh, poor and needy people. They have to believe the truth. I have to check them out. And we give, we've give. we been giving uh, Robin Peters down in Amarillo, Texas. We send her $300 a month out of our benevolent fund. And we've been, she's got leukemia. And her leukemia bill, her her medical bill runs fifteen thousand a month, but her insurance pays for that, and she barely makes enough to live on. So we send her help, and then we send this lady down in Prairieville, Louisiana. We send her a couple hundred dollars a month. She's a paraplegic. We we're buying her a van. She's going through a government program. She's going through, um, it's a program to, to have her buy one of these wheelchair accessible vans, but the government will pay for approximately half of it, we understand. So we've already got enough money to buy the van, and uh, we're going to wait and see what the government does, and then we'll, we'll pay for the whole van if we have to. But that's a wheelchair accessible van. Um, if you want free DVDs, just contact us. Look at our website, graceandtruth.net. We do accept offering, but we never ask for money for the ministry. We accept it because it takes a lot to keep this ministry going. It takes about forty-five to 46000 a month just for us to break even here. And uh, we've got five full-time people counting myself, Tom, Mike, and Dave, and my wife, Mary, and they keep this ministry going. I just teach. When you want a DVD, call Tom. All I can do is send, is get a message from you and then give it to Tom because he's the guy that does all the correspondence. You can call him at 615-264-7115. And uh, you're welcome to all the DVDs we've got. All right. That'll be enough. Uh, I'm trying to get enough together to buy a building. Anything extra we have over our, over our uh, cost, anything over that we put in the building fund. We don't need a big building. We just... No more than what we got here. 100 people. That'll be plenty because you cannot build a big ministry on what I teach. Christmas is pagan, Easter is pagan, God doesn't love everybody, predestination is true. You cannot build a mega church on those doctrines. Of course, I believe most people in mega churches are lost and going to hell. That's what I believe. They have no daily cross, no debt to self, no self denial. All right, I'm ready to teach, I think. Wait a minute here. Wait a minute, Mike. Give everybody one of these. Let me have one myself. You 
can I trust the King James Bible completely? That's the Bible I use because it comes from the correct text, the Textus Receptus. And there's so many words that have been translated incorrectly, and I don't have time to go through that. I'm Jim Brown, your Bible teacher at Grace and Truth Ministries. I'm teaching to you out of a... I use a King James Bible, but that's not what I believe in. I believe in the Textus Receptus, which is the original Greek text that is in an interlinear Bible. I said this while I was doing the announcements, but the interlinear has the Greek on the top line and the English right under it. I don't even trust this English because I don't leave translators get things right and they can't get everything right because it's like I said earlier, uh, there are no indefinite articles in the Greek. A and an is not in the Greek text. When you see 8,000 years, that's not what it says. Don't have time to go through all of that. Let me give you something here. We don't have any indefinite articles, and we got one definite article. One definite article, the. I learned that from in elementary school down in Texas when I was a little kid. Here it is right here. Well, I thought I was at it. I was at it. Hold on. This is this is the definite article. Well, I keep running past it. Y'all forgive me. If you don't, I'll preach at you and make you repent. I've, I had it a while ago, and I just clicked past it. Here it is. You've got... These are the definite articles in the Greek right here. B. There's 24 ways just to spell B in the Greek text. 24 ways. You have no A and no an. Anytime you see it in a King James Bible, it's not in the original text. In fact, when you look at John 3.16, it says in the Greek text, for the God, the, it's actually whole, the God, theos, the is masculine gender, singular. These are all the ways to spell the. It depends on if it's singular or plural. Masculine, feminine, neuter, gender in the singular. It depends on where it is in the sentence, how you spell it. Nominative case, that's either the subject or the predicate nominative. I learned what a predicate nominative was in the 6th or 7th grade, and I never forgot it. A predicate nominative is the same thing in the predicate. The predicate is everything past the subject, Jim. Jim is, that's the verb, 
the if it's a predicate nominative, this line has to lean forward. Jim is the pastor, is pastor. And any modifying words go under here, the. Jim is the pastor. Pastor and Jim are the same thing. Pastor is the predicate nominative. So that depends on whether it's nominative case, masculine, feminine in the nominative case, or neuter, a table, a, a desk, a car. And whether it's genitive case, genitive means it shows possession. Baptism, I like this, baptism of repentance. The fact that you, the fact that this is genitive case, when you look up of repentance, is baptism of repentance, it'll tell you of repentance is genitive case. That means that repentance, true repentance, that baptism belongs to repentance. That means it cannot possibly mean water. And a blood baptism was death to self. And repentance means to be turned away from self and think differently. Repentance means death to self. Death to self. Everything that's righteous in the Bible means death to self. Everything in there. That's why I put this pinwheel on the board last message and I just got started on it because everything here branches off into dozens of different things. I put this on the board. We've talked about faith. It takes more than just defining faith. It takes to understand this is all God's sovereign will. To be sovereign means to be, you think of a king over a nation being sovereign. That means his word is law. You can die at his word or you can live at his word. The word of God says we have to die. Everything up here has to do with death to self. I've said that faith has to do with death to self. And I may just stay on this subject because I want you to see how everything in the Bible branches away to everything else in the Bible. Now the Bible says in Hebrews 11 and 1, Hebrews 11 and 1, this is the best definition for faith in the Bible. It's just like, it's just like, uh, uh, Agape, the best definition for agape in the Bible is Second John six. That's as good a definition you can get. Well, faith, the Bible says, faith is. Faith is. If you have is, went right after a noun. It means is means I'm going to define this for you. Faith is. This is amazing because when people get confused about the 144,000, the 144,000 is is a constant where it means equals. When you look at, I'll just, I'm not going to go through it. I'll just show you this in Revelation 14. People say they're confused about the 144,000. You can't be. Because it says right here in 1 Corinthians 14, talking about the 144,000 in verse 3, it says, these are. Are is plural for is, singular. These is a reference back to the 144,000. So these equal these equal. And all you got to do is define the rest of the words that they're equal to. And it goes on to say, these are equal, which do not def are not defiled with women. Well, 
defiled with women means they are virgins. When you go to 2 Corinthians 11, chapter verse 1, he says, uh, he says, well, he'll tell you who they are. I'll go ahead and tell you who they are. It's really not even hard. He says in 2 Corinthians 11 and 1, this will define not defile with women. And it's talking about spiritual defilement. Sometimes I get off on a get off on something. I can't get back on it. All right. Second Corinthians eleven and one. My Bible's falling apart. I can't hardly turn the page. All right, eleven and one. Would to God you bear with me and my folly indeed bear with me, for I am jealous over you with a godly jealousy. For I have espoused you to one husband that I may present you as a chaste virgin. That's one that's not defiled. How can we be virgins and not defiled? God spoke of defilement as being as going after other gods. In fact, he called that spiritual fornication to Israel. That was their lovers, their other gods. Well, he says, so he says, that's us not defiled with women. How would that be? That would be the inner man that can't sin. The inner man, you got an inner man and an outer man. The outer man serves the law of the flesh. The inner man serves the law of God. And the inner man is Christ in you, the Christ in you, the hope of glory. Christ in you. So that's the part that's virgin and can't sin. And then he goes on to say in that Revelation 14, and these are they that follow the Lamb. The 144,000 follow the Lamb. Follow is the word akulatheo, A-K-O-U-L-A-T-H-E-O. Akulatheo means to be in the same way with. It's the same word in Luke 9.23. Luke 9.23 that says, If any man will come after, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. Same word as follow. It's the same word when Jesus said to Matthew, follow me. It's an imperative command. So follow means to be in the same way with. And there's only one way that we follow Christ in the narrow way. There's two ways, a narrow way and a broad way. Notice how difficult this is not. It's not difficult at all. It's, there's a narrow way and a broad way. Narrow is the word the lebo, T-H. You say, Jim, you put that on the board so many times. This is a different place. Same word. The lebo comes from thalipsis, T-H-L-I-P-S-I-S. And thalipsis is the common word tribulation. So the 144,000 ones that follow Christ in tribulation. We must through much tribulation enter the kingdom of God. Notice this is not difficult. No more difficult. To find the words, it's not hard at all. And then he says, They follow the Lamb whithersoever he goes. These were redeemed at Garazzo. We were redeemed by Christ's blood from among them, being the first fruits. What do you mean we're the first fruits? James 1.18 Of his own will beget he us that we might be a kind of first fruits. How hard is this, the 144,000? I just told you what it is. It's the church. It's a figurative number for the church. 12 is the number of the total church. 12 times 12 is 144. Then you got these 
144,000 mentioned the seventh chapter of Revelation. Now let's get back to where I was. I just stopped real quick to show you what the 144,000 are. It's not hard to understand. You just got to define a lot of words. Now, we're talking about faith. We're talking about this pinwheel here. Faith, let's define it first. The best definition for faith is Hebrews 11.1. 1. Hebrews 11.1 1 says faith is substance. Or faith equals substance. Now you can have somebody define the 144,000 get, get 100 preachers and they'll be arguing for 5 hours and I just gave it to you in 5 minutes. Boom. It's real simple. Definition resolves everything. Have you noticed that? It's like falling off the log. Why would God give us a book like Revelation that we could not understand? Defining words is it. That's what makes it happen. So he says here, in now we're talking about faith. Faith is equals substance. Substance is not a hard word. Substance is the word hypostasis. It comes from hupo, meaning under, and stasis, meaning to stand. Hupo also means sub. Sub. A submarine means under the marine or under the water. So an understanding is a substanding, that's a structure, that is a foundation. It's a foundation that you build upon. I could go into that, but I won't. Now, in understanding, but the Bible says, there is none that understandeth there in Romans 3, Romans 3, 10 through 12. There's none that understanding. He's talking about Jew and Gentile all over the world. He's talking about after they grow up, nobody understands. So if you have an understanding, God has to put it there. If you have a substance, a substructure, substructure. The word is actually uh, Thamalios, T-H-E-M-E-L-I-O-S. That is the word foundation. Foundation would equal substance, hypostasis. Now, if you have an understanding that you can build on, if you have an understanding, you have to have an understanding heart you have to understand mind if you're going to go to school and take calculus. It doesn't mean you understand. You've got to be able to evaluate and understand. Understanding is a condition of the mind. And God's got to give you that because there's none that understands God. So if you do have substance, you have understanding. If you have understanding, you learn. You've got the word Mathetes, mathetes, which is a learner, M-A-T-H-E-T-E-S. He got the word mathetuo, M-A-T-H-E-T-E-U-O, which is the word teacher. And it comes from this same word. And you have the word manthano, which comes from this, manthano, which is, is to learn and a learner is called a mathetes or a disciple. And the Bible says in Luke 14, Luke 14, 27, He that beareth not his cross and followeth after me cannot be my disciple, cannot learn. 
He doesn't have any understanding. And that's faith. So a daily cross is produced. It produces faith. And crosses are for dying on. And Paul said, I die daily. And he said in Luke 9, 23, if any man will come after, let him deny, deny aporneomai, A-P-A-R-N-E-O-M-A-I. Let him deny himself and take up his cross daily. But you had to be condemned to a cross in the first century. I've said that a hundred times. You could not be put on a cross if you were a Roman citizen. You had to be a slave or a criminal to die on a cross. They crucified Jesus as a criminal for calling himself God. Let a man deny himself. Let him utterly contradict himself. And follow me. And take up his cross. Take up. And follow. And the amazing thing is, is deny, take, and follow all imperative commands. Imperative commands of God. Now, so if you the only you got to have a cross, you got to be condemned for telling people truth. That's what they'll condemn you for. I've got a lot of people that write to me that want to condemn me. Now, we're talking about faith. Faith is understanding, but nobody understands unless God puts it in their heart. Now, there's things about faith you need to know. Faith must increase. It has to. Look over here in Luke. The... 17th chapter. Luke 17. I gave you a paper there. I want to show you something. This is called a word study concordance. I'll go ahead and give you this. This is a word study concordance. This is second only in my studies to a word, to a a Strong's Exhaustive Concordance. When you look up a word in your Strong's Concordance and you look that number up in here, I've given you, I've given you, I seem to be crisscrossing myself, but I'll give it to you as I think about it and as I go. I'm giving you on this page, these two papers, the word phileo. And all of its morphemes. Morpheme means word shapes. Word shapes. Phileo. You got two words that have been translated love into the New Testament in English and both of them have been translated L-O-V-E and they're not the same word. I don't care what these Greek teachers tell you. They're not the same word. If they were the same word, why didn't they translate it the same word? Because it wasn't the same in the Greek. You have the word phileo and you've got a whole bunch of morphemes, word shapes that are connected to that. Phileo means to have affection or to like something. This is all, it's like a trail that comes out from the sovereignty of God. Don't trust L-O-V-E in your Bible. Go and find out if it's phileo or agape. Agape, in Second John 6, says this equals agape. It actually says this is love. You can change is to equals. And love is agape. And it means to walk after the commandments of God. That has nothing to do with phileo. Phileo means to like something. I like my dog. I like my car. I like to get drunk. I like to buy drugs. I like 
going on a Ferris wheel. I like I like uh, chocolate. You can like anything, but that's not agape. Agape, Second John six says, this equals agape. This equals agape that we walk. Walk everywhere you find agape. You can just substitute walk after his commandments. When the Bible says in Romans 9, Jacob have I loved, that's the word agape. Jacob have I, have I given my agape to. Of course, Jacob's name was changed to Israel in that 32nd chapter of Genesis. So, you might as well say, Israel have I given my commandments to. You can substitute equals for equals. The results are equal. That's a, that's a simple algebraic axiom. You've learned the first week in algebra. Things uh, substitute for equals. The results are equal. So you can substitute for agape everywhere you find it walking after God's commandments. You can substitute Israel everywhere you find Jacob. So, Israel have I given my God my commandments to. Who did he give them to in the Old Testament? Israel. How many to give to, to Esau? None. That's why it says Jacob have I loved. I've given him my commandments. Now, I've given you this paper here. This is out of word study concordance. You can look down here and you can see this word phileo on the bottom of the first page. 5368. It'll tell you it comes from 25, but it doesn't. 25 is agape. These, these are the numbers out of the Strong's on the left hand side. That's the number out of the strong. It'll give you the words that it comes from on the right hand side, but sometimes it's not exactly true. And you can see phileo down here on the bottom, 5368, that's phileo. And it'll say, they, it goes into love or loveth or phileo, and it'll go all through here. Then it'll tell you here, in 50, on the second page, 5384. It, it comes from 5384. Philos, which is the word friend. So philos and friend come from the same word, philos. That means friend. That is a form of phileo form of flail. It means to have an affection. And Jesus said, let's see if I can find it here real quick. Jesus said here in John 15, in John 15, look at verse 14. You are my friends if you do whatsoever I command you. Well, can you identify whatsoever I command you with agape? Can't you identify it with that? Because agape is walking after God's commandments. So this second half of this verse, you can substitute agape there. When he says, you are my friends, if you agape me. You can actually substitute agape right there. If you do whatever I command you, friend is the word philos. It's that. So there's no such thing as unconditional love. God will only be your friend. You can be God's enemy and be a believer. The Bible says, 
Friends with the world are enemies of God. Friendship with the world. Well, when you look down here at verse 5373, you see that? On the left hand side of that second page, 5373. That friendship of the world is enmity with God. And friendship is the word philia, P-H-I-L-I-A. That's just another form of phileo. You can learn a lot simply by learning your word study concordance. And then you can look down here. Look down at 5381. These are... These are compound words in the Greek. And in verse 5381, philoxenia comes from philos and kazenos. Remember kazenos? X-E-N-O-S or X-E-N-I-A. Remember that? It means, think it not strange concerning the fire trial, which is to try you. Strange is the word kazenos or kenizo, X-E-N-I-Z-O. And it means an occasional guest. So, when he says, be given to hospitality. Instead of coming up with some English word, that just means to entertain or have an affection for strangers. Of course, it's going to be, it's, that's what philo, kazenia, comes from philos, affection for strangers. But you got to keep that in context with everything else. You can't have an affection for strangers unless they're walking in truth, right? Just like you can't have an affection for a brother unless he's walking in truth. And then you can look at 5377. Philos, philo, theos. Lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God in Second Timothy 3 and 4. Lovers of pleasures more than philos, theos, philo, theos. It comes from philos and theos. Philos is an affection for God. H-I-L-O-S, theos. You can go through here and look at all of these words. You've got Philonikia, which comes from philos, and nike, which is victory. So that means you like to fight. So that's, uh, it talk, it's the word strife in Luke 22, 24. And it comes from the same word in 1 Corinthians eleven sixteen, fifty three eighty. 53, 80. If any man seem to be contentious. In this case, the contentious is wanting to get victory over your enemy. And then you've got, you've got Philo Kazinos in 5382, an affection for strangers. And then you've got up here, in, you've got Philema, which is holy kiss in 5370, it all comes from the same thing. Then you got 5369, lovers of pleasures. That's philohedonis. It comes from philos and hedonis. And hedonistic person is one who's going to have fun doing anything he wants to do. He doesn't care what it costs. That's a hedonistic person. So lovers of pleasures has a lot deeper meaning than just looking at that. So all of these things come, then you look at, at uh, 5383, Diotrephes, who loveth to have preeminence, comes from philos and protos. Protos, we get the word proton from that. 
And a proton, we believe, is first or the smallest particle or first particle of an atom. So he loved being first. He had an affection for first in line. And anywhere these, and you got down here in 5385, Philosophia comes from philos and sophos, which is the word wisdom. It means they love to have wisdom. You got that twice, 5385, 5386. And then you got down here, you got everywhere you got these philo connected with a word. It can help you to learn the Greek words better by looking at the prefixes on a word. You see what I'm saying? Just look up the word philo, and it'll tell you philia, philo, philia, philos, uh, all the words that have to do with affection. So I thought I'd give you that. You can keep that. Take it home with you. That's why you need, everybody needs a word study concordance. If you'll notice, if you'll notice, in the left, just look here on the front page, 53, 55. It'll tell you it's mentioned nine times in the Bible. It gives you every time it's mentioned. Envying, envy. And sometimes the English words are different, but they're the same Greek word. So learn to look at your... That's why when you look up a word in your concordance, look at the words surrounding it. Look at the words before and after it. A lot of times they come from the same word. It makes the Greek language smaller, and you can learn words faster. All right. Now, let's get back to where I was. Let's get back to faith. When you're reading, when you see faith, faith is more than just substance. The Bible says faith has to grow. If faith grows, then substance grows, doesn't it? And your daily cross grows, doesn't it? Faith has to grow. Look at Luke 17. I don't know how I can ever get through all this. It's just, I've seen this for years, how they all connect together. Every one of these things on this pinwheel has to do with debt to self, debt to self, debt to self, debt to self. All of it is killing off that outer man, every bit of it. Self is our main problem. Remember a demon? Jesus called a demon self. He rebuked, Jesus rebuked him. I got it up here somewhere. Jesus rebuked him. And this man had an unclean demon. In Luke 4, same man had an unclean spirit. In Mark 1, and Jesus rebuked A U T O. Auto. In fact, when the Bible says that men at the end of time will be lovers of their own self, the word is philos. A U T O. Lovers of their own self. So that's what Jesus said the man had in Mark 1. He rebuked him, masculine, gender, singular. Demons are just you. That's all it is. There's no such thing as demons. That was their superstitions. Now, you got to, every one of these things I've got on the board, every one of them are going to branch out into dozens of other things. This faith is going to branch and keep branching. It's all, it's going to branch into all kinds of things. That's why when you study a word, you can't just get the definition of it out of a Strong's. You've got to go into your Strong's concordance and, or go into 
a word study concordance, make some copies of a page, and just go down and see everything that this word does. It's like the word faith. When these Baptists that I've been around so much, and my father being a Baptist preacher, it's saved by grace, you saved through faith, not, not of yourselves. It's the gift of God, not of works, not of works, not of works, not of works, not of works. Ah. Sounded like a parrot. And they, in those independent Baptists, say, works has nothing to do with your salvation. Yes, it does. You don't work to be saved. But if you're not saved by a working faith, you're not a believer. And what is it that works in you? It is God that works in you to will and to do of His good pleasure. That's the inner man that's working in you. That's the new birth that's working in you. It's God working in you to will and to do of His good pleasure. Philippians 2.13 Now, I've got to give you what faith works. Let's go to Galatians first. Galatians 5. Notice how all of this connects together. Galatians 5. Look at verse 6. For in Jesus Christ neither circumcision availeth anything nor uncircumcision, but faith which worketh by love. Faith works. Period. Well, love is walking in the commandments of God, isn't it? So faith works. by agape but let's substitute what we've already defined agape as faith works by walking after God's commandments you know how far this goes Whew. walking after God's commandments everywhere Jesus or the Bible says Every word has an imperative command. Every word Jesus speaks of an imperative mood. That's a command. It's just as much of a command as he said in the beginning when he said, let there be light. It's just as much of a commandment from Jesus because he was the God in the beginning and he made all things and all things were made by him. Without him was not anything made that was made. So he made everything. So faith works, works. E N E R G E O N. Energion, which is our word energy, it's energized by walking after God's commandments. It's like I've said if I told you I bought me another car. You came over to the house and I got this real nice looking car. And you say, boy, that's a really nice car. And you come over. And the car is car. I said, well, I call it Faith. I've named it my car, Faith. Mm -hmm. And you say, well, let's open the hood. And you look in the hood and you said, it doesn't have a motor. There's no motor there. Mm -hmm. Faith works by the motor. The motor is God's agape. You cannot separate faith from good works. My father and all of his friends would quote Romans 2, 8 and 9. By grace you are saved through faith, and that not yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. I never heard my father or anyone else quote the next verse. Nobody. It's Ephesians, huh? it's Ephesians isn't it? What did I say? Two. Ephesians 2, 8, 9, and 10. And Ephesians 2, 10, I never heard my father quote it or even read it. 
are none of his preacher friends. We are his workmanship. Workmanship is the word poema, P-O-I-E-M-A. Created in Christ Jesus unto good works, agathos. Beneficial works. Beneficial. Poema. That is, that is, comes from poeo, P-O-I-E-O. Poeo means to do or to work. But it's not the, not the common word work, it, which is the word e, e n e r g or E-R-G-O-N, E-R-G-O-N. Ergon is the common word toil or work, toil. That's not this word poema. Poema has the idea of a, of a tapestry. Or a mosaic. It's something beautiful. And he has created us in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained before the foundation of the world. Before ordained. Pro E T O I M A Z O. Puerto Amazo comes from pro, meaning before. Hetoimos, H E T O I M A S, which means to fit up in advance. He has ordained that we do these good works of God. Did not, was not Abraham justified by works? When the Lord said, take Isaac, your son, your only son, and take him to Mount Carmel and offer him as a sacrifice to me. And Abraham took his son, Isaac, and headed up to Mount Moriah. That's where they're going to build Jerusalem at a later date. But that's long before Jerusalem. And he takes his son Isaac up there. And his son said, Father, where's the sacrifice? And Abraham said, God will supply himself a sacrifice. And he tied his son up like he would tie up those sacrifices, those sacrificial lambs. Tied him up with the right knots. And he raised the dagger and he had full intent of plunging it into Isaac. And God stopped him. He didn't say, are you sure, God? He had full intent of killing Isaac because the Bible says in Hebrews 11 chapter that God was able to raise Isaac again from the dead because he had already raised him in a figure, in a parable. What do you mean he raised him? He raised him from the dead loins of his father and the dead womb of his mother. That was calling things that be not as though they were. And Abraham staggered not at the promise of God. And he had full intention of killing his son. And by those works, Abraham was justified. D-K-I-O, D-I-K-A-I-O-O. It means rendered innocent. So Abraham was justified by his works. He had full intentions of killing his son because he knew God had already promised he's going to bless all the world through the works of this son, Isaac. That's why the Bible says, And Isaac shall thy seed be called. How was Isaac called? From the dead. That's the gospel. That's the gospel that was preached to Abraham that Galatians 3rd chapter says. The scripture foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith preached before the gospel to Abraham. What was that gospel? He raised Isaac from the dead. The gospel is resurrection from the dead. And he raised Isaac from the dead. Now, look here in Luke. 17th chapter. If your faith doesn't grow, I may be on this pinwheel for some time. 
I have seen that everything that you're talking about, about the sovereignty of God, sovereign means over all everything, the good and the evil. I have seen that everything has to do with death to self. Self must die. Every subject I can put up there, the scapegoat, deny self, spiritual circumcision, Drink in the cup meant to undergo a death. Blood baptism meant to undergo a death. Spiritual Sabbath has to be with death to self and believe God, period. And the scourge, God says, I'll beat you until you do bow to me. That's what the scourge is for. And we're predestined to conform to the likeness of Christ through that scourge. And then... De demon means to fulfill self. Self has to die. The demon in all of us has to die. Now, look here in the 17th chapter of Luke. And the apostles, verse 5, the apostles said unto Jesus, Increase our faith. And the Lord said, I'm going to tell you how your faith has increased. If you have faith as a grain of mustard seed, you might say to this sycamine tree, sycamine tree was another brand of a fig tree. Be thou plucked up by the root, be thou planted in the sea. Everything that's cast into the sea is Babylon. Babylon was the mother of harlots, and she was founded on self. That's what has to die. And it should obey you. And which of you, having a servant plowing or feeding cattle, will say unto him, by and by when he come in from the field, go and sit down to meet when you go in the field. That's not your first that's not your first obligation. And will not rather say unto him, Make ready wherewith I may sup and gird thyself and serve me till I have eaten and drunken, and afterwards thou shalt eat and drink. Doth he thank the servant? Does Jesus thank the servant because he did the things that were commanded him? I think not. So likewise ye, when ye shall have done all these things for God in your life, who was it gave you the strength and the power to do all of them? God. We are unprofitable servants. We have done that which was our duty to do. That's how your faith is, is, is increased. But you have to have faith as a grain of mustard seed. I want you to go over here to Matthew 17, 20. Matthew 17. When the Bible says, it says it many times, he said, except you have the faith as a grain of mustard seed. It's not talking about, they used to sell these little bracelets with a little glass and they had a mustard seed in it and they showed it a mustard seed was real small. Except they never did have as small as a mustard seed uh, was. The mustard seed was the smallest of all of the seeds in a garden. It was less than the size of a grain of pepper. The birds love the mustard seed. They would gobble it up. And here's what the Bible says. Look at this. Matthew 17, Matthew, let me go to 13, 31. Matthew 13, 31. Wherefore I say unto you, we're talking about faith increasing. What does it mean? All manner of sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven unto men, but the blasphemy against the Holy Ghost shall not be forgiven men. 
I'm in Matthew 13. 31. 31. 32. Whoever speaketh the word against the Son of Man. I think you're in the wrong place. Huh? You're in the wrong place. I sure am. Matthew 13, 31. Oops, I'm in the wrong place. 1331. And another parable put he forth unto them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like to a grain of mustard seed, which a man took and sowed in his field, which indeed is the least of all seeds in the garden. It's less than the size of a grain of pepper. But when it is grown, it's the greatest among the herbs of the field. It grows to be 17 to 18 feet high. That's the kind of faith you've got to have. It has to increase exponentially to the point it becomes much greater and that that would once have devoured it the birds what well, it will tell you here it is the greatest among herbs and becometh a tree so that the birds of the air come and lodge in the branches thereof and they can't harm it anymore when your faith grows birds are equated with evil men here and they can't harm you when your faith grows. Now, look over here in Luke 13. In Luke 13 and verse 18. 13 and verse 18. If you're... Faith has to grow. Luke 13, verse 18. Then said he unto, unto what is the kingdom of God? Remember the kingdom of God was a title for Israel. And, and Jesus said in Luke, the 11th chapter, if I with the finger of God cast out devils, then the kingdom of God is coming to you. And that's a term for Israel. will I resemble it? It is like a grain of mustard seed which a man took and cast into his garden and it grew and waxed a great tree and the fowls of the air lodged in the branches thereof and they couldn't do it any harm anymore. The evil man of the world, the older you get the more your faith grows. They can't harm you anymore. Now look here. Look here in Luke 17. Luke 17. Now we, we looked at that. Look at Matthew 17, verse 20. Matthew 17. Matthew 17. Jesus has come down off of a mountain. And a young man is brought to him by his father. In verse 14, When they were come to the multitude, there came to him a certain man, kneeling down to him and saying, Now notice this is not Jesus saying it. It doesn't mean that Jesus believes him. Lord, have mercy on my son, for he is moonstruck. Says a lunatic, it means moonstruck. It comes from lunar, which is the word moon. Now he's either a werewolf. Werewolves go long back, or he is a vampire. Werewolves and vampires go back thousands of years. In fact, if you're going to study werewolves, You've got to study lycanthropy, L-Y-C-A-N, canthropy. That would be what you studied if you studied werewolves. Now this man is saying, my son is moonstruck. Does Jesus believe that? No. 
Why did he say that? Because the whole society said those things. He just stuck on moonstruck. <sighs> He's lunatic. And he keeps falling in the fire. Now this man came up with this idea himself because of his society talked about having demons and having being moonstruck and being lunatic and everything was the cause of some demon. That's what they said a vampire was in the first century. It was a demon. You can look up vampire in, in the Hastings Encyclopedia. It'll tell you this is a really the most peculiar thing. It'll tell you a vampire was a demon out of, out of Hastings. And they said the way you got rid of a vampire, you had to put it in a bottle and throw it into a fire. A bottle? What was a bottle? It was a familiar spirit. Familiar spirit in the Old Testament. There's no such thing as familiar spirit. It was a con job people were putting on the people. It was a bottle. Every time you find familiar spirit in the Old Testament, it's the word O-W-B. It meant bottle. So, what was a bottle to them? It was not a glass container. It was a goat's stomach. And they would dry it out. They would sew up, sew it up. They would plug in one end, and they would put a stopper in this top end. And then they would, the guys that had learned ventriloquism, they would say, Pass my palm with money and I'll talk to your great aunt or your grandmother who's been dead. And then they would peep and mutter, peep, making strange sounds, claiming to be talking to their grandmother, getting advice as to whether they should buy a house or not, if they should plant a certain garden or whether they should go to war. They would go and consult these witches. Witch is the word kasaf. C-H-A-S-A-P-H. S-A-P-H. And kasaf meant to speak smooth words. A witch was not an old hag flying around on a broom. He was a smooth talker. Oh, Sounds like Billy Graham to me. He was a witch. Not by our definition, but by biblical definition, he was a smooth talker. So was Charles Stanley. These guys are smooth talkers. They don't believe in predestination. They never talked about it. They didn't believe in a daily cross, self-denial, death to self. I don't believe these guys. So they would take a strap, put a strap on it, carry it wherever they went, put their wines or their juices in that. And when it came time to con somebody out of money, those that had learned ventriloquism would claim to talk to their dead ancestors. That's why the Bible says, Thou shalt not suffer a witch to live. They were stealing people's money, putting the con on them. There's no such thing as demons and witches and all these other things that go with that. That's man's wicked heart. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know the heart of man? Nobody can know it. It's a wickedness that's in man. Now, let me give you a couple more of these. When they translated ob or bottle into the Septuagint, LXX, around 200 B.C., some brilliant translators that knew Hebrew and Greek translated the Old Testament Hebrew text into Greek, and they called it the Septuagint. And when they translated familiar spirit, which is the word ob, this is the word they translated into. 
in gastro muthos. It means gastro is the word stomach. When you have gastrointestinal problems, drink Pepto Bismol or whatever. Yeah, stomach. Muthos means myth. In means within. In gastromuthos means a myth within the stomach. Even the translators knew that it was a con. And they translated it right. Anytime somebody's wanting to get money from you so they can talk to your ancestor, they are liars. Once they're dead, they're dead. The rich man died and in hell he lifted up his eyes and the Bible says anybody who's there can't come here. And Lazarus died and was carried to Abraham bosoms. And the dead know nothing at all about what's going on on the earth according to Ecclesiastes in the ninth chapter. Now, I don't believe any of these superstitious things that's going on. None of them. The heart is what's evil in a man. And that's it. Now, so, your faith has to grow. Look over here in second, second Corinthians, 10th chapter. 2 Corinthians 10. Paul said, when I write to Corinth, you don't like it because he says in verse 10, his letters say the Corinthians are weighty and powerful and his body presence is weak and his speech is contemptible. We don't like the way he talks to us. The people in Corinth didn't like Paul. Of course, they were babies. They were baby believers. He said that in the third chapter of 1 Corinthians. Look at verse 11. Let such and one think this, that such as we are in word by letters, when we are absent, such will we be also indeed when we're present. I'll be harder on you if I get there to Corinth. He didn't cut any slack for the Corinthian church. Then he goes on down here and he says, in verse 14, For we stretch not ourselves beyond our measure, as though we reach not into you. And to you, for we are come as far to you also in preaching the gospel of Christ, not boasting of things without measure or outside the word of God, that is, of other men's labors, but having hope when your faith is increased that we should be enlarged by you according to our rule abundantly. The word enlarge means to extol. You've been giving me a thunder and a hard time because I've written hard words to Corinth. Corinth was as apostate as any church is in the Bible. They were just a million miles from the truth. And God jumped their case hard. Now, the preacher's given a hard time as long as I tell you you have to repent daily, cross, death, self, self, denial, Christmas, pagan, predestination is true. Give the preacher a hard time. We don't like what he's saying. If your faith will be increased, you'll quit giving me a hard time. Now, look over here in Second Peter. Faith has to grow. Let me stop on the way over there in Second Thessalonians, the first chapter. The word increase is the word oxano, A-X-U-N-O. Oxano, Lord, increase our faith, oxano. Make it stronger. 
And he tells the people at Thessalonica or Thessalonians, they're up there on the on the top of the Aegean Sea, right next to Turkey, the western, eastern part of Turkey. How much time do I have, Mike? 24. All right, maybe I'll get some of this in here. I don't know why I can't... Find me a map over here. Why can't he come by there? Yeah, that'd be good right there. All right. And Thessalonica was right up here. Right about there. Right next door to Philippi, this is the Aegean Sea. This is the Adriatic Sea, right next to Italy. Italy's called a boot because it's shaped like a boot. This is Sicily, where most of those mob characters come from. But this is Greece here. And right up here is Thessalonica and Philippi. And then Paul comes down here to Athens and Corinth here, preaches, and then he goes back home. So he says to the Thessalonians, in verse 2, Grace unto you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We are bound to thank God always for you, brethren, as it is meet or necessary, because that your faith groweth exceedingly. Groweth exceedingly is one word. Hooper. Oxano. A X. You know. Your faith has to grow. That We've just been dealing with just a couple of these points here. With faith growing. We're going to 2 Peter. And let's look here in 2 Peter. Does your faith have to grow? We had a guy that used to come here. He said, you got all the faith you need when you first get saved. Well, you don't get saved for one thing. Now let's look at this one of my favorite chapters. I keep saying that about a bunch of these chapters, don't I? But I love this chapter because it's talking about faith growing. Let's read from the start. Simon Peter, a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to them, he's writing to a particular people, to them who have obtained like precious faith with us. So he's writing to people who are believers. He's not writing. None of these books were written to unbelievers, to vessels of wrath fitted to destruction through the righteousness of God and our Savior Jesus Christ. Grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and Jesus our Lord. According to his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness. Through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue. Whereunto are given unto us exceeding and great and precious promises. He's talking about us, believers. That by these you might be partakers of the divine nature of God when your faith grows, having escaped the corruptions that are in the world through lust. And besides all this, give all diligence, add to your faith. And you think you don't have to, your faith don't have to grow. You want to conquer a lot of things in the world? You're going to have to grow. In my 80s, I have learned I can conquer a lot of things, but I don't conquer them. God conquers them. God does my fighting for me. 
I refuse to fight anybody any, anymore. These guys that write to me and correct me on the Bible, and they don't know what they're talking about. You guys don't understand. I'm not going to fight you. God fights my battles for me. I just say, Lord, you fight, you fight all of our battles. I can't fight the world. I have learned that as I got older. The world is a bunch of hard-nosed people. They're evil vessels of wrath, and you can't beat them. But God can beat them. And then he says, add to your faith. Add is not, he's not asking you, would you like to add to your faith? Add is an imperative command. He's not asking anybody to add. It's an imperative mood. Epi. C-H-O-R-A-G-E-O. Epicoregio. We get the word choreography from this word choregio. C-O-R-E-G-E-O. The Jews had a circular dance, or what they called a sacred dance. I got a book written by Jews, Sacred Dance, and it's called the Sacred Dance. Epi means upon or cover with. He's saying, cover your life with this dance. And there's seven points to it. And this is how you get strong in the faith. There's seven things you add to your faith. Number one, virtue. I could spend all day long talking about virtue. Virtue is the word arete, A-R-E-T-E, and it means maturity. Grow up. Do you think you're just as strong at three years old as you are when you're 25 or 30? You're not. When you are a child, and the Bible speaks of the Corinthians being babes. He said, you need to be fed with meat, but you're too young. You have to, I have to keep feeding you with milk of the Word, which is for babies. Milk is nourishing for babies. When people say, well, these preachers out here are preaching milk, I say, no, 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 they're not. They're preaching sewerage. <laughs> these Baptist churches are not preaching milk. Milk is healthy for babies. And then he says, virtue. Grow up. That reminds me of the word teleos, T-E-L-E-I-O-S. Teleos is the word perfect, be therefore perfect. But it doesn't mean any different than a rete. It means to grow up and to be mature. Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect there in Matthew, the sixth chapter. He's talking about grow up and be mature. In fact, that is a part of the word when the perfect is come, T-E-L-E-T-E-L-O-S, I-O-S. Teleos means grown up. Mature. When the perf when the church has come, that's why it goes on to say, When I was a child, I spake as a child. I understood a child. When I became a man, I put away childish things. That's what he says right after he says, When the perfect has come. Let me show you one verse that has to do with that. Colossians, the third chapter. He's talking about all the things you have to put off. You have to put off the outer man. I can't get everything into one lesson. In fact, it may take me six months just to skim the top of this. And he says here in verse 14, he just got through telling the Colossian church 
what to put off and then what to put on. He says in, in verse 10, put on the new man, the inner man, which is the man that serves the law of God because the outer man, which he says put it off in the previous part of the chapter, mortify this outer man and put on the new man. Then he says down here in verse 14, above all these things, above all what things? Holy, blessed, beloved, bowels of mercy, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering, 13, forbearing one another and forgiving one another, if any have a quarrel against any man, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. Above all these things, put on charity, agape, walking in the commandments of God, agape put on agape which is the bond of perfectness agape is the perfect when the church grows up and they're able to walk after the commandments of God And Peter said during his lifetime, the perfect was here, T-E-L-O-S, which is a form of teleos or teleotes. He said the perfect is here, the church is mature, and all of these gifts of an apostle have died away when Epaphroditus showed up to visit Paul at Rome. Paul had lost his ability to heal. He couldn't heal him anymore. And he had, Paul had the ability to heal people. He got bitten by a deadly Mediterranean viper, which had enough poison to kill a dozen men. And he just slung it off his hand. And that was the, one of the miracles of an apostle. So he says, above all these things, put on. Agape, which is the bond of perfectness, means completeness. And the church became mature during the lifetime of Peter. He said so. Now, let's go back over here to first, to Second Peter. Add to your faith. So he's talking about faith increasing. See, I can't preach this pinwheel without getting into faith increasing. And that is not to even... I've got to go back to that pinwheel and show you that all of these things has to do with death to the outer man. Death to the flesh. And to knowledge. And he says, to virtue, knowledge. Gnosis. How long does it take you to learn all these words? Yes, the rest of your life. Thank you, Tim. It's going to take you the rest of your life. To... I didn't learn all these Greek words in it for one study lesson over a week. A lot of the things you hear me teaching I learned a week ago, a month ago, six months ago, five years ago. 10 years ago. Some of them I learned 20 and 30 and 40 and 50 years ago. I do remember a lot. You know why I remember a lot? Because it's interesting to me. Pray that God will give you the interest. That's how you can remember so much is being interested in what the answers are. And it's not going to be what you hear some preacher say down the street. So knowledge is gnosis, and to knowledge temperance, enkratia, e j, e g, k r e t e i a. Inner comes from e n, and kratuo, k r e t e u o. Inner strength, inner strength for what? control yourself on 
what? Not just sex, eating, buying, exercising. Boops, I hit me there. I had to watch out. Whatever you should be doing or not doing, it is forcing yourself to do right. And when God increases that inner man and he starts to overcome the outer man, it's easier after you've been a believer for 25 or 30 years to conquer that outer man. But it's not easy when you're young. It's real hard when you're young. Then he says, and to knowledge, temperance, and to temperance, patience. It's an interesting word. The trying of your faith work is patience. Count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptation, knowing the trying of your faith work is patience. And let patience have its perfect work. Let it happen. Patience, hupo. Mone, M-O-N-E. That is the noun form of hupo, meno, M-E-N-O. Hupo mone is patience. Hupo mone is the word endure. That's the verb form of patience. He that endureth to the end, the same shall be saved. Who's going to endure? Every one of us, because God, he that hath begun a good work, and you perform it till the day of Jesus Christ. You have to increase in faith. And then he says, to patience, godliness, Eusebia, E-U-S-E-B-E-I-A, it means to be godly, or like God, I like what one writer said. He said it has the resurrection scheme involved in it. Resurrection. Resurrection means to come to life. Anastasis. It means to come to life after dying. Come to life. And how often do we die? Daily. How often do we take our cross? Daily. You've got to be dying daily. That's hard to do when you're young. But the older you get, it becomes tolerable. It doesn't become completely easy because the inner man will overtake the outer man. But... The inner man is Christ in you. Is Christ in you. That's the inner man. That's Christ. And God's going to take you through year after year after year after year of tribulation, trials, persecution. And He's going to teach you to quit fooling with the people that you used to fool with when you first come to Christ. Quit running around with the world. Have no fellowship for unfruitful works of darkness, but rather rebuke them. What fellowship does light have with darkness or does Christ have with Belial? None. I have learned to separate from the world and I don't mean I'm better than the world. And the reason I separate is because God tells me to separate for those people who walk disorderly. If a brother walks disorderly, separate from him. You're supposed to have brotherly love if he will allow you to do that by his walking in the commandments of God. But you're supposed to separate from him when he won't do right anymore. Let's go back to this. And to God in this brotherly kindness, there's another one of those words. Philos Adelphos. There's that word Philos. It's on that page there you got. A D E L P H O S. Adelphos is the word brother. Philos means an affection for your brothers if they're walking right. What do you mean if they're walking right? Well, the Bible says here in 
én uh, I was going to give you a verse and I can't think of it. If a brother if you if well he says in First Corinthians the fifth chapter if a man calls himself a brother and he's living wrong this guy's having an affair with his stepmother he's having an affair with his stepmother not to keep company with him he says I wrote unto you in verse 9 I wrote unto you an epistle not to company with fornicators yet not altogether with fornicators of this world or with covetousness or extortioners or idolaters for then must you need you'd have to leave the world but now I have written to you not to keep company of a man that is called a brother well that's a hard place to understand and then he says if he's a fornicator and he's covetous an idolater or a railer or a drunkard or an extortioner with such an one with such a brother don't even eat with him don't go to his house do I have any time Mike? Three. Lordy me and he says that if a man is a brother in First Timothy, in First Timothy, now we command you, verse six, chapter three, verse six. We command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you withdraw yourself from every brother that walketh disorderly. So this is a real hard place to come to. Love your brothers if they will walk in God's commandments. But don't hang around a guy that calls himself your brother and he drinks a little and he cusses a little and he does all these things a little. And I'm just, I've been talking about faith increasing today. I hadn't even got to inheritance increasing. Inheritance is death. There's a death involved. I'll come back to that next time. This pinwheel, you can put nearly anything that has to do with God or godliness and put it out here. Just write anything down. It's all has to do with God is in charge of everything. I think I'm about out of time, ain't I, Mike? I can't do much in two minutes. Well, let me go ahead and read the rest of this. Verse 7 of chapter 3 of... of, uh, of 2 Thessalonians. For yourselves know that how you ought to follow us, for we behaved not ourselves disorderly among you, neither did we eat any man's bread for naught, but wrought with labor and travail night and day and we might not be chargeable to any of you you're to withdraw yourself from brothers that walk disorderly that word withdraw stello means to abstain pull away from it has basically the same meaning mark them which sought causes of visions and offenses that are contrary to the doctrines you have learned and avoid these people at clino is an imperative mood a command in Romans 16 17 Romans 16 17 because they that are such serving our Lord Jesus Christ but their own belly and by good words and fair speeches, they deceive the hearts of the simple. Good words and fair speeches are not what believers need. They need comfort, but they need to be admonished, which means rebuke gently. Well, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, thank you for truth. I, sometimes I don't know what to pray for well most of the time I pray for the flock here that you'll strengthen them and cause them to be strong in the faith <clears throat> God I, 
I don't know the direction to go sometime. Lord, you open up whatever opportunities you can for this ministry. And God will praise for everything, glorify you for what you do. Strengthen the sheep. Fight our battles in Christ's name. Amen. <clears throat> if you don't have a strong word study concordance, they don't print these anymore. You'll probably have to find one on Amazon or something, but I wouldn't take for mine. It shows you all these words that are connected together. It's like leaven because it, the kingdom of God grows, but to liken the kingdom of God to sin. It's just saying the kingdom of God well, is it's sin. not. It's not always sin. No, that don't mean sin there. That just means leaven will take over a piece of. But, uh, I know it doesn't, but I'm just saying it, if you if you, you don't have somebody like you teaching you, somebody would think hmm, leaven sin. 